Good morning. Please be seated. I'm very honored to be with you today. I'm a Franciscan from New Mexico, but Father Ed kindly invited me to spend some time here this weekend. And uh, I was already in California for the month where I just finished writing what I hope is a book on the true self and the false self. And uh, so it makes it rather easy for me to preach this morning because in many ways the, the two readings lend themselves to it. In the first reading, we have what is really one of my favorites from Jeremiah where he's moving the Jewish religion beyond its, at that point, its external reliance upon external authority and beginning to plant the basis for inner authority. When you have those two in good balance, you tend to have very balanced people who can honor wisdom beyond them and bigger than them, but also can come to a point of inner experience and can say, I know for myself. And when your knowing meets the big knowing, you've got good knowing. That's, that's the goal. Uh, well, I must say, it's, it isn't often achieved, at least in my experience. Uh, being from the Catholic tradition, we have tended to emphasize the outer authority, and it can have the experience of keeping many people at a rather childish level. Well-intentioned, but they, they aren't even encouraged to have inner experience. But what we have Jeremiah saying here, I will put the law within you. I'll write it on your heart. I'll be your God and you will be my people, which is the great covenant line that they often repeat. And then he says, no longer shall they teach one another. So I said earlier, well, why am I up here, you know? Uh, fairly, fairly you're, if you get to that point, you don't need other people to tell you. All they can do is second the motion. You, you know it for yourself, and they tell you you're not crazy. So I hope whatever I'm saying this morning will tell you, I hope you're not crazy. Hmm? Then we come to the gospel, um, where Jesus uh, goes right to the heart of the matter, and as he often does in saying there's a price you have to pay for this kind of big knowing. Uh, and he says the single grain of wheat, it's a marvelous metaphor really, the single grain of wheat that each person is, it has to die to itself. Now, uh, maybe you know or don't, that's actually, to many of you, I'm sure it sounds very Buddhist because they're saying the same thing, that the small self can't get you very far. And Jesus calls the small self the single grain of wheat, where you look out at life from your preferences, what you want, what you need, what you understand, what you prefer, uh, and at that point, your life is all about you, <laughs> which isn't a very big life. But a lot of people, that's all they know. That's the only way they've been trained to think. They haven't moved to, to the contemplative level, higher consciousness, the spiritual level, the eyes of Christ, whatever you might want to say. And what Jesus is doing is trying to get us there. And he's saying unless that single grain of wheat dies, it remains just a grain of wheat, which is fine, but not what I'm talking about. But if it dies, if it can let go of its little ego boundaries of thinking it's all about me and what I want and what I need and what my hurts are and my fears are, if you can move beyond that, you're capable of a much bigger seeing. Uh, it's much more compassionate, much more forgiving. It's much more inclusive. Low-level consciousness is always, always decides who is not like me. And it pretty much gets trapped there, as we've seen in the tragedies in our country these last few weeks. Always people who are unworthy, not like me, another race, another whatever, and it becomes fully justified in their little mind, and it is little, uh, you have to say that, in their little mind it's all justified to even kill. And if we look at human history, uh, much of this has been done, I'm sad to say, in the name of religion and the name of God. Because if you have God behind you saying these people are bad and my people are good, well, you can kill with impunity without any guilt, but actually feeling rather good about yourself. 
Brothers and sisters, you've got to know that's what we're dealing with in our world. And why this somewhat hard message, uh, and the messages are getting harder as we now move two weeks into, or a week into Holy Week. That the, the, the language of something's got to die for something to live. Now, in the book I just tried to write, I call that, that something that has to die your false self. It's not your bad self. It just isn't real. <laughs> it allows you to do very stupid things uh, without realizing they're very stupid. Uh, and now, normally, the trials of life, the suffering of life, the maturity of life, little by little along the way, you learn to distinguish between the real and the unreal, between what lasts and what doesn't last at all. And you recognize the different aspects of the false self. Your skin color, your sexual orientation, your ethnicity, your country, how much money you make, your car you drive, the clothes you wear. Brothers and sisters, every mystic and saint and prophet would say, that's what's going to die when you die. And if that's all you have, you got nothing. <laughs> That's the false self. And we live in a country, and you live in a state, which prides itself, I mean, because it's the nature of the ego, on sort of, you know, pushing forward my false self to look better, to look more beautiful, to drive a bigger car, whatever else it might be. Uh, you've never gotten down to the basic of who you really are before that, before you made any money before you got your law degree, before you were a doctor, before you were a priest. Uh, who were you? Well, you were a child of God. As Paul says it in Colossians, who you are hidden with Christ in God. That's the true self. And there's nothing you can do, nothing whatsoever, to create that self. <laughs> You've got it. You're stuck with it. <laughs> the only difference in this room is the degree of awareness that you draw your life from that who you are hidden with Christ in God. And these people do tend, all things being equal, to be much happier. They don't emotionally go up and down like the rest of us because they've seen through the shadow and the disguise of the false self. And again, I want to repeat, it's not bad. It's just inadequate, sort of stupid. So it can't get you there. It can only get you to small groups of people who look just like you do. And I'm afraid that's, that's been a lot of tribal religion in history up to now. Tr gathering people who are just like me. And making ourselves feel superior and saved in that very small context. And of course, by definition, therefore, it's not salvation. <laughs> uh, I think it was Eddie Breslin years ago said uh, Catholicism, and I know you're Anglo-Catholics just like we're Roman Catholics. He said to be Catholic is to say, here comes everybody. Mm -hmm. At least it should be saying that. Mm -hmm. Because that's the word that uh, the church took to itself already in the second century. This universal people. This people who discovered the real, the substantial, their inner DNA, their divine nature, and that created the level playing field. That created the common ground. That created the community. And as I just said, once you see it in yourself, totally undeserved, unmerited, unachieved, then you know everybody else has it too. And all of your stating of preferences of these people are better, those people are worse, these people are right and those people are wrong, it all falls apart. It means nothing. It, 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 you start seeing with what most of religions would call the eyes of God. And it's beautifully put in this particular gospel from John 12. That it all starts saying these two disciples, we want to see Jesus. We want to see. And then Philip passes it on to Andrew and it's all about learning how to see. Religion is about learning how to see. <laughs> and the broader you can see, the more you see with the eyes of God. It, it's so simple that it's hard to teach. It really is. <laughs> 
Simple things are very hard to teach because for some reason we're convinced it should be complex. You see, salvation, and I don't think this makes me a heretic. Some of you might think so. But. so <laughs> salvation is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. When are you going to get it? And, and a lot of people, uh, hospice workers are telling us this, a lot of people put it out, off till the last five months, the last five days, some the last five hours, and believe it or not, some the last five minutes. But according to the testimony of thousands of hospice workers, almost everybody gets it at the end. You know, I've got to let go of all of it. And so what we say about salvation, I want to say also about death. It's not a matter of if. <laughs> it's a matter of when. <laughs> and what religion is about at its more mature levels is dying before you die. Dying before you die, and then you're not afraid of dying. As the poet said, death can do me no harm. But you have to have done it once to let go of what you think is essential. What you think is absolutely true and forever me, and if I don't have this, I can't be happy. So, so we're practicing dying ahead of time, you see? And little by little you say, you know what, that's not me, that's not me, or don't need that. Now these are the people who don't have to wait for the last five days of life to get it. They find the essential self. You see, the true self is nothing you create. As I said before, you can't, because you already have it. You fall back into it. You fall back into it. You collapse into it. And you say, Eureka, as Jacob, at the foot of Jacob's ladder, you were here all the time, and I never knew it. And my great sadness after being a priest for so many years is, in my experience, even the vast majority of Christians don't know it. They're still trying to achieve worthiness and and uh, they, they never get worthy enough. And, and as long as they keep trying to climb, they always live with a kind of sense of inadequacy and inferiority. And what the gospel, I believe, is saying very clearly in today's version is that you can't get there, you fall there. 